All right, guys, we are inside of the Silver Sides Museum here, which is actually right outside of the Silver Sides. So um, just kind of take a peek here. You can kind of see some of the stuff. I'm doing it in high depth here, so you should be able to zoom in and see some of this. This will show you some timelines. Um, and this is about the attack on Pearl Harbor. Kind of hopefully get a good view here. You can see a little bit before, of course. We'll kind of look down there in a second. We do have a nice little model here of the Silver Side show, actually below the waterline as well. is Pittsburgh. It's got a nice little model here too. And yeah, kind of mentioned the gun that's right in the middle here, right? By anti-aircraft, something like that it looks like. Here's some really cool things that they're talking about the silver sides here. So um, the food, one of the best reasons to be in the submarine forest. Um, this is we may face claustrophobia, stale air. The enemy is always on our tail, but the food can't be beat. So it looks like they got a bunch of bunch of stuff that they could uh, definitely eat there. And it takes some. So this is uh, Patrol One. Ten days on the first patrol, Captain Brillingham spotted our first target, little sail schooner. It wasn't worth the torpedo, so Captain called the gun crew. The fire warning shot across the bow, take her down if necessary. She shot back. The gun crew was racing back back and forth, shoving bullets into large deck gun, and the schooner's crew pelted us with machine gun fire. Mike Carbon, a young kid from Oklahoma, hit the deck and didn't move. Passed bullets over his body while yelling at him to get up. Uh, yelled the lookouts uh, to get Mike to the dock for help, but it didn't matter. He had been hit and was dead before he hit the deck. Buried him with full honors at sea after sunset. Um, so that was the first fatality on the first patrol, it looks like. Um, but you can see patrols, it shows where they were going. So they went right up to the Japanese main, uh, mainland there. So the launch, it shows over here too. So uh, launched August 26th, 1941. Um, I did ask about how many sinkings that the, uh, that the uh, submarine had, and they said officially, there was 22, but if you listen to the captain, there was actually 30. So they had an official documentation of 22, um, but the captain said that there was 30. Uh, there's a lot of more, a lot more stuff that's over here too. Um, by the way, there's a really well-known story about it too that there was actually an appendectomy that was done on the boat that. Uh, wasn't supposed to have been done because they just weren't equipped for it, but they really didn't have a choice, but um, the person survived. So um, it was successful, even though that they weren't equipped to do it. This is pretty cool too, guys. It actually shows the inside workings of a torpedo. All those gears for the little shaft back there. Hey guys, I'm right here at 
the aft of the uh, silver sides here. Um, once again, in Muskegon, Michigan, um, this boat is 312 feet long. Um, it's actually in the channel between Muskegon Lake and Lake Michigan here in, uh, in Muskegon here. So um, definitely wanted to show you guys this. This is a beautiful beach. So 27, a beautiful boat, 27 feet across. Um, it says uh, displacement is 15, 25 tons surfaced, 24, 10 tons submerged. Um, standard complement was eight officers and 72 enlisted. So that's 80 people. Um, it was uh, keel laid was on November 4th of 1940 and it launched august 26th of 1941 uh commissioned december 15th of 41 decommissioned in april 17th of 1946 um and uh it is uh been in muskegon since 1987. it also says that it's one of the uh, most famous surviving submarines of world war ii sunk more than more ships 30 japanese vessels damaged 14 and took down more tonnage than any other surviving world war ii submarine uh, she rescued two american pilots and laid 16 mines on separate patrols uh, the very first appendectomy ever performed on a submarine um, was on the silver size it was also uh, depicted in the movie destination tokyo uh, starring Cary grant and the movie below was filmed on board the Silver Sides. But uh, I do know that they're working on doing a restoration too. They're working on putting it in dry dock. And I know they're, uh, they've been trying to put uh, get some donations to do that. But um, you can kind of take a pretty good look here. You can kind of see the uh, hull definitely needs some love there, of course. But we're going to go on board this thing, guys. So... So we're gonna, you do have to buy a ticket. Tickets are just under 20 bucks or like 17 and change. Um, so we're gonna hop on here. We're gonna come across the gangway and come on board the boat. So I have known about this boat for a long time. I have never been on it. So we're gonna kind of see it all together at the same time. Um, but, uh, and I know this is a long fact for the day, but uh, I wanted to uh, show you guys some of the things. So you got aft gun your deck gun there like you got two people on there or either side um, and then this dedicated to the memory of mike carbon killed on this spot on may 10 1942 by enemy uh, machine gun fire i believe that was the first one that we were talking about the first uh, uh first patrol so uh, we're just going to kind of take a peek at stuff here so let's walk through it now, i know whenever you're on a boat you don't uh you don't take anything for granted for uh space especially on a submarine so but you can kind of see there's the 236 course see the rest of the conning tower over there periscopes up top now i did notice that uh um, there was something where they said there were actually two periscopes and you can see on the back side that there's one so there's one that's a smaller one and one that's the bigger one the bigger one was apparently a lot more uh detailed it's a lot more high def uh if you call it that for for the day the smaller one was the one they actually used to shoot on the on uh enemy fire or to shoot on enemy ships because that one was harder to see in the water so if you had that big one shot straight up there then you could uh, uh, be seen a little bit easier by the enemy and they could shoot at you first so uh, you obviously didn't want that to happen but uh, so that might have been for like loading torpedoes or something I, I would guess um, it says entrance down here it says walk down backwards let's try that Wow. <laughs> you can 
see the water over here splashing up. Right? It says entrance down over here. Let's see the outside hull, the pressure hull. Like I said, I've never been in here, guys. So this still says walk down backwards. So you can see the water line is right there. So like I said, this boat has been here for a long time. So, but you can definitely see antiquated. I know they said a lot of these panels were for uh, you could like just lift stuff up, right? But definitely uh how'd you like to sleep here <laughs> you get to sleep holding a torpedo you see the torpedoes right there so um wow so wee bit claustrophobic in here there's the head and the shower so take a look it was uh, enlisted crewmen were given a shower every 13 to 15 days officers three to five days so yeah, if you're a high level, you got to shower once a week. Um, the oh, the mess cooks and baker were allowed to shower every day. Well, that makes sense. So, so yeah, I guess we'll go this way. I do have to say, I'm not claustrophobic. This is tight. <laughs> And then there's your, I'm guessing that's a crew mess in here. So, a couple of war patrols. Another spot to sleep. Could you imagine being under the water and not knowing what was going on? And, and the respect you get for these guys just walking through. You know? I mean, you, like I said, you got a bed everywhere. You had 80 people that were supposed to sleep. You figured about, you know, and you got three crews, or, or you probably have three shifts, if you kind of think about it that way for sleeping. So you had 80 people, you need a third of them to sleep. There's your yeoman's office. So, wow. So get, just getting through these things, guys, I'm not a small guy. This is kind of rough. Um, <laughs> just getting through here. Wow. This is interesting. Do not attempt to operate any valves or levers. Yeah, please don't. It's <laughs> Yeah, main flood control manifold. Yeah, let's leave all that. Not an exit. Okay. I don't really know where I'm going here, but you know. And it's not really a guided door. Um you kind of go by yourself. But yeah, here. Walking all the way back here. 300 feet. Getting through here. There's your mess hall. They cook for all the people. The other one must have been the officer's mess. So, here's where the... And then, hey, look. You get to cuddle up with uh, everybody. But yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of wasted space down here. Right? <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all the way to the aft. This thing is... Uh, there's another couple toilets so you get to know your neighbor real well here and it said do not use I'm not planning on it and then another a shower <laughs> we're back here hey engine Apparently these engines are still made and they still make parts for them and they still run these engines. How y'all doing? Good. I'm lost. You too? Uh, <laughs> I, I think we're doing it backwards. I'm not sure. Oh, are you? Well, I'm I'm, sure. I'm, I don't know. There's a the port back here, right? I'm um, hoping I don't have to walk all the way up there because, man, getting through those, through those port holes are fun. Yeah. 
that one. Yeah. But I know they still run these engines too. Do they really? Yep. Yeah, they're still in operating order. I think you have to be about five foot two though with the engines. Well, wait till you see some of these beds. You want to talk about getting cozy? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Hard enough to get through ports. But yeah. So the engines don't actually turn the propellers. And by the way, if you look down here, you can see all these these pieces will all come up, so you can get to different uh, different things. But the engines don't actually run the propellers. The engines create electricity. And then they store the electricity, of course, and then they would run the propellers. So, um, what's up? Not much. But, uh, yeah, Chicago. <laughs> Definitely these uh, watertight doors. So. Nope, you're going the right way. And then, man, this is the electrical room. I know that. So you can see all the spots. Let's just let air get back in there. Look at some of these gauges, guys. These things are really interesting. I mean, this is just preserved history, right? It's all a generator, port starter. All these things, I mean, these are, everything is just solid history, so, um, kind of look down the other side, but there's, yeah, no wasted space, right? Everything's got a spot, it's got a place, it is really, really cool to actually be on this sub, so, once again, no wasted space, so now you're to the aft torpedo room. So we were at the bow torpedo room before. Here's your aft torpedo room. It looks like they were smaller torpedoes. Uh, just kind of from that one right there, it looks like a smaller torpedo, but more beds, guys. So we're gonna sleep, pick one, you know? Um, I think they called it warm bunking. So as soon as uh, one got out of a bunk, somebody else got into it. So, um, and then, uh, yeah. And I think they probably brought the torpedoes down there maybe, I don't know, but. Um, we have another port up here. I think I brought them down here. Who knows? We're going to go upstairs here. Um, but we're, it's definitely, if you have uh, some health issues with walking or balance or stuff like that, I don't know that I'd suggest coming up here. <laughs> but uh, I do also know that the um, propellers are removed from this. And it is because of a treaty, apparently, with Canada that we won't have any readied warships in the Great Lakes. So um, I think that's from the 70s. So, but we're on the back side now. Um, so, and, and I know there's a little bit more to it than, uh, than that, but we're all the way aft looking forward of this submarine. And uh, yeah, so here's all that stood between those men. <laughs> And, and rushing water apparently coming out. That is nuts, right? <laughs> so a little bit of metal and you're a few hundred feet below below uh, the surface and not knowing uh, what is uh, out there for you. You can't see anything. You're going off of sonar, right? So there's not a whole lot that, uh, that you could do. So, but uh, really, really cool experience guys so if you've never thought about being on a submarine that's world war ii uh the new submarines i know are bigger than this but man you talk about a new respect for our you know the, the men that would have been on this boat so it was all men at that point the respect that you have to have for the people that served here the 80 people and i'm sure there was more than that over its lifespan of course but the 80 people at one time that would go down to protect the United States and, and uh, that, you know, they signed up for it, guys. So it's, you know, this, like I said, this is a really cool boat. It's a really cool piece of history. Um, it's definitely worth preserving because uh, a lot of the men that, uh, that served on this boat are probably no longer with us. Uh, I'd venture to say most of them. So, um, but uh, this is 
part of the reason that we won World War II as America. And it's a really cool thing to be a part of and to be able to have gone on the uh, USS Silversides here in Muskegon, Michigan. So uh, definitely look it up if you're ever up in this area. It's a really cool experience to go through this museum like I just did. They've got torpedoes down here outside. The museum is really cool on the inside and the outside looks really nice as well. They give you a couple of extra things that you can see here too and we'll take a bigger view of the silver sides here but more torpedoes you also have a conning tower that's right there you can go on to and then obviously a, a deck gun that you can take a piece um, there are i believe the original propellers um, that were taken off so you actually see the two screws and we're taking off here so ship serial number so it's got everything on you can see things that were uh, in here so suitable for ss212 um, so this may not may or may not be the exact one that was on there um, let's see this one and see what this one says on here so suitable for c drawing so But yeah, this is a, a pretty cool, if you want to see the, the height of the propeller, I'm, I'm about six foot tall and you can see the height of this propeller over top of me here. So um, it's, it's just a little over six foot, it looks like for the, uh, the overall height of the propeller here. So um, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting too. So. But yeah, if you kind of take a look, you can see just a, like I said, it's a beautiful piece of history that you might not realize that there is a, uh, U.S. Navy submarine from World War II that's sitting, <laughs> excuse me, that's sitting this close to where you might be. I mean, if you're in, you know, anywhere near one of the Great Lakes, you're not that far away from this. You know, if you're anywhere near, you know, uh, I mean, obviously the drive up from Tennessee isn't that long, um, but it's just, I, I love to find something to do that you can do that you can say you did it all right okay so. guys so this is a history of the silver sides and it's about as accurate as you can probably hope to find because it is actually from the navy so um this is a, a bunch of information that you can see it's kind of interesting too because you can come over here and you can see other uh other uh, warships and their history in that and you can kind of go from there and there's, you know, uh, visit our museum. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with the naval history, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down here. And you can see that this is Silversides SS-236 off of the Mare Island Naval Yard in California on the 31st of March 1942. All right. So that's obviously when the war is going on, right? So um, that is going to be when the... You know, the, the sub was out on patrol. And um, and they did say, that if you notice the conning tower, those things can be a little bit different because they were actually modified to lower their profile and stuff like that. But um, I'm going to show you here. So it's a Gato-class submarine, like we were talking about. It was commissioned Mare Island Naval Yard, California, on the 15th of December, 1941. So this was, I mean, the 7th, December 7th of 1941 is when Pearl Harbor happened. So this submarine was not around during Pearl Harbor, but it was really quick afterwards. So, and it did a lot. It was one of the most accomplished submarines that was out there. And you're going to see a lot of what happened down here. So, um, it said Lieutenant Commander Creed C. Burlingame in command after a shakedown, uh, off the U.S. West Coast, the boat set sail for Pearl Harbor with World War II escalating on all fronts. Uh, so it steamed to Japanese home island waters um, in the area of Kisudo on the 30th of April, 1942, uh, for the first of her many successful combat patrols. 
Ten days into the patrol, the Silver Side sank a Japanese tra trawler with her three-inch gun. During the engagement, like we talked about and I showed you on the deck of the Silver Sides, um, the enemy used one of its machine guns to s kill the Silver Side's deck gunner. All right, we, we saw that here just a little bit ago. So, in retaliation, the American gunners on the submarine riddled the enemy vessel until it spewed flames and sank. So, um, they just kept firing until the thing was gone, it sounds like. Um, just three days later, they attacked an enemy submarine. Although explosions were heard, a positive sinking could not be confirmed. So, like we were talking about earlier, so the captain said that they sank 30 ships, but they were only credited with 22, and then this article actually says 23. So, um little discrepancy there but um when the captain says we sank 30 this is part of the reason so explosions were heard a positive sinking could not be confirmed so i'm sure they probably looked for the boat and couldn't find the boat well it's gone it's probably sank but you can't prove it so well there you go so um that's part of it i guess so now on may 17th the silver sides torpedo then sank a 4,000 ton cargo ship while damaging a second enemy vessel during the battle, the submarine's periscope became, became entangled in a fishnet marked by Japanese flags and held afloat by bamboo poles. As the Silver Side bored in for the kill the, on the enemy cargo ship with a fishnet and Japanese flags stuck on top of the submarine, she fired a spread of torpedoes that tore the enemy's stern wide open. With that ship sinking, they proceeded to attack a second ship, but its final fate could not be determined at that time. Once again, there's a second ship that obviously they attacked them. Obviously, they hit them because they're saying the final fate could not be determined. So, um, patrol boats began to close in on Silver Sides after the brazen attack. So, the submarine quickly departed the area. Um, let's just say, ran away. Um, <laughs> but later, the patrol, the Silver Sides damaged a freighter and a tanker before returning to Pearl Harbor in June. Um, so, definitely a very successful mission. Um, with only the obviously major issue that they lost one of their men. So um, about a month later, the Silver Sides returned to the area of Kisudo for her second patrol. On the 28th of July, the fighting submarine uh, sank a 4,000 ton cargo ship, followed by the sinking of a, a passenger ship Nikaya Maru, on the 8th of August. Later in patrol, the Silver Sides damaged a large enemy tanker and sank two enemy trawlers before returning to Pearl Harbor. On her third war patrol in the Caroline Islands, the Silver Sides had no confirmed sinkings but inflicted severe damage to a large cargo ship and deployed torpedoes that scored several or scored, sorry, scored hits on an enemy destroyer. Although the extent of the torpedo damage on the destroyer was not known at the time, the patrol ended on the 25th of November in Brisbane, Australia. So a lot of times they were actually going between Pearl Harbor and Australia. Those were the two main bases in World War II. So um, Silver Sides obviously, obviously saw both the Australia and uh, Pearl, of course, during then. So on December 17th, the Silver Sides set her sight on New Ireland for her fourth war patrol. While in the middle of the ocean on Christmas Eve, a pharmacist mate, this is what we've already talked about, performed a successful emergency appendectomy on one of the crew members. So this was on Christmas Eve, guys. They completed it on early Christmas Day. So... Uh, I'm sure that that person was very thankful, uh, of course, and from what I understand, that person lived a long life after that, so um, pretty cool. So so it said, Silverside surfaced uh, only to be forced deep by a Japanese destroyer and subsequent, subsequent depth charge attacks. After surviving the lengthy, lengthy attacks on personnel aboard, the Silversides believed the worst was behind them and surfaced again, only to be greeted by the same enemy destroyer and ensuing aerial attacks. So... Uh, they thought it was over, and then they came up and found out they were just waiting for them. So um, it is a cat and mouse game with the subs, especially back then. So um, after an enemy aircraft dropped three bombs near near the submarine, causing severe damage, the Silver Sides went deep and leveled off just before crush depth. Um, I believe crush depth on the Silver Sides was about 300 feet. So um, it leveled off just before that. So. I'm pretty sure it was 300 feet on that class, on the Gato class. Um, submarine survived the uh, survived the attacks later and surfaced to recharge her batteries and perform emergency repairs. Later in the patrol while off truck, 
the Silver Sides torpedo and then sank a tanker, Tayo Maru, on the 18th of January of 43. Just two days later, the boat had one of its most productive days of the war. After stalking an enemy convoy throughout the day, the Silver Sides steamed ahead of the enemy vessels and lay in wait. Uh, as the enemy moved closer, the Silver Sides fired a barrage of torpedoes that sank cargo ships. Uh, and you can read them here too. Saburu Maru, Sundono Maru, and Mie Maru. Uh, so three cargo ships. During the engagement, it was discovered that one of the torpedoes was stuck in the forward torpedo tube. Since it was impossible dis to disarm a torpedo uh, in the tube, of course, they decided to refire it, which I guess was really dangerous. So... Um, but they put the submarine in reverse and they shot it. So apparently something about being in reverse, trying to get away from it, I guess, um, as it would hopefully come out of the tube, which it looked like it did. So, um, looked like it just kind of shot itself into nowhere. Um, so the war patrol was terminated ahead of schedule in late January due to a serious oil leak and you can see an oil leak on, on water. So, um, so on 17th of May. They steamed into the Solomon Islands for her fifth war patrol uh, with her primary mission to lay a minefield um, in the Stefan Strait. So on the night of, uh, that's between New Hanover and New Ireland, on the night of the 10th and 11th of June, they sank a f just over 5,000 pound or 5,000 ton cargo ship, the Hyde Maru. For her effort, she was rewarded with severe, although fruitless, enemy depth charge attacks. Uh, the Silverside returned to a uh, Brisbane for a refit, malfunctioning torpedoes, and a lack of targets plagued the submarine's sixth war patrol, uh, which that was actually a, the uh, torpedoes that were malfunctioning was a problem throughout the uh, first part of the war. Um, it's commonly known on that, but um, it wasn't just the silver sides. Everybody had that problem. But uh, she returned to Brisbane intact but empty-handed. On her seventh patrol, the silver sides sent cargo ships. Uh, Tan Maru, Tanan Maru, and Kazan Maru, and the passenger cargo ship Jahor Maru to watery graves. So, um, on her eighth and ninth war patrols, the stellar submarine wreaked havoc on enemy convoys, um, sinking Tenposan Maru, and Sinchinzi Maru, and Ryutu Maru, and Kofuku Maru before returning to Fremantle um, in April. So they so on her 10th patrol off the Marianas, uh, Silver Sides destroyed six enemy vessels for more than 14,000 tons of enemy shipping. Her 11th war patrol was not as productive, but they managed to rescue sister submarine USS Solomon, uh, SS-182, that had been dam badly damaged by depth charge attacks. While Solomon was under attack, uh, Silver Sides deliberately drew the attention of the enemy and then quickly dove to escape their gunfire. Soon, submarines USS Trigger and USS Sterlet uh, joined the Silver Sides in guarding and escorting the stricken submarine back to Saipan for repairs. On our 12th War Patrol, by the way, I want to go back to that. That just, the submarine crews were all really close knit. And from what I heard, there was something like 3% of the people in the Navy were part of the submariners, but there was about 100 submarines um, by the time that the war was over. There was about 100 of them, but. These guys were close. I mean, they, those, I guarantee you, everybody that was on those subs, they, they were, they knew that the, uh, the sub that they were escorting, the Solomon, would have done the same thing for them, guaranteed. So, um, that was a, a pretty big thing that, uh, that the Silver Side started there. And, um, I know that it would have been done for them if it had been the same thing, but just kind of a, a, a little, you know, my take on on what i think on that but um so anyway so on her 12th war patrol in east china sea a few worthwhile targets were encountered um however on the 25th of january of 45 they sent a spread of torpedoes at a 4500 ton japanese cargo ship uh, the malay maru and um sending it below the waves on her 13th patrol the, uh, they joined a coordinated attack on the USS Hackleback and or not on attack with the USS Hackleback and the USS Threadfin patrolling off of Kyushu. Um, although targets were few and far between, the submarine damaged a large freighter and sank a trawler before returning to Pearl Harbor on the 29th of April. 
Um, her 14th and final war patrol was spent as lifeguard duty in support of airstrikes on Honshu, Japan. Um, on the 22nd of July, the Silver Sides rescued a downed fighter pilot and two days later rescued a U.S. Army aviator. Uh, she returned to Guam for a retrofit on the 30th of July, but hostilities ended with Japan in August of 1945. So, um, and I saw something too that also mentioned that uh, they had, the subs had been so successful sinking uh, ships that there was very little left to do. I mean, there's there wasn't a whole lot left that Japan had that the you know the U.S. hadn't sunk. So um, they were very successful, and the submarines were a big part of that. And the Gato class was one of the main ones. Obviously, that was there. There was a couple of others that were involved, but this was one of the workhorses of the war for World War II. So um, Silver Sides received 12 battle stars and the presidential unit citation for her war service. According to uh, Joint Army Naval Assessment Committee figures, the Silver Sides was credited with sinking 23 enemy vessels. Like I said, they uh, if you look at it, it said 22 on one of the things that I saw, 23 per the military here, and the captain says it was 30 or, you know, 300, who knows, um, but <laughs> the captain says 30. Um, I once caught a fish that was this big, right? You know, it's kind of, but it's still at 30, it's the most successful submarine out there. So you're, um, and, and there's something else that's had, I'd seen 31 on one, but 30 or 31 would be the, the top. So, um, regardless, it was extremely successful. So, uh, but it shows 90,000 tons of enemy shipping. Um, after the war, they set sail for New London, Connecticut, where she was decommissioned on the 17th of April, 1946, and placed in reserve until the 15th of October, 1947. It was then placed in service as a training ship for naval reservists at Chicago uh, for the remainder of her service. Her name was stricken from the Navy list on June 30th of 69. South Chicago Chamber of Commerce promptly applied to the U.S. Navy for custody of the Silver Sides, to preserve her as a memorial. In 1987, the submarine was moved to Muskegon, Michigan to serve as the centerpiece for the Great Lakes Naval and Naval Memorial and Museum. The Silver Sides is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and as a National Historic Landmark. The museum is now known as the USS Silver Sides Submarine Museum. So, but that that's it guys, USS Silver Sides. It's uh, obviously the number 236 on there. Um, obviously, they're like I said, they're planning on uh, doing some work to it. But um, definitely take a look at it and see what you guys think. See if uh, it's something that you guys would want to do. But uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful boat for uh, history, and, and we need to maintain it, I think. So um, it is pretty cool. But take a look down here. And I know the video went long and tried to make it to where it wasn't too long. Um, I know the fact for the day videos are always supposed to be less than five minutes, but uh, I think you guys can agree this one's special. Um, and then definitely give me a like and a subscribe on it and uh, show you my beautiful face here right next to the tower again. So definitely give me a like and subscribe. And uh, did you guys know that there was a submarine from World War II in the Great Lakes? Packed for the day. Steve Welch. You guys have a great one. Bye.